Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Chen. I'm the Global Head of Destination Marketing, Marketing at Kluk. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to be invited by Seoul Tourism Organization for this webinar. And we'd like to share with you guys on our view on how COVID-19 has impacted the tourism industry and also the latest social media trends that we see that might help you guys in your work, uh, hopefully soon. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, start with my uh, very short uh, introduction. Uh, before I joined Kluke, I used to work in Hong Kong Tourism Board and also TripAdvisor uh, before. So spent quite some years in the tourism industry and I've always been a marketer. So um, uh, destination, travel and marketing have always been the center of my passion. So he's very excited to be sharing something on this topic with you guys. A little bit about our company. Uh, we are the world's, one of the top uh, one-stop platform for in-destination experiences. So we are an OTA focused on something other than flight and hotels. Uh, what we sell on a platform include attractions and shows activities and experience like cooking classes, um, different kind of experiences, tours and sightseeing, uh, F&B, food restaurants and food, a local transfer like trains, uh, private car rental, tra uh, airport transfer, travel essentials like SIM card or luggage storage services, and also events and entertainment, including movies, concerts, and all kind of shows. So basically everything you want to find in any destinations, you should be able to find on Kluge. Um, that's our vision. Uh, we operate in many different countries. That's why we have actually support 14 different languages. Most of the Asian languages, of course, including Korean are supported. And um, in terms of our users, we have roughly 30 million plus monthly users, monthly visitors before COVID-19, definitely. And 75% um, of our bookings were made on mobile platforms. So we are, we are definitely a mobile first company, a mobile first OTAs, and we prioritize our mobile usage, user experience uh, over desktop. In terms of a uh, uh, geographical source of revenue, Greater China contributed 35% of our revenue, including China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Japan and Korea contributed 15%. Southeast Asia uh, contributed 35%. Uh, and the rest of the world, including Australia, New Zealand, North America, and Europe, these are our new markets, they contributed 15%. Uh, to our revenue. And most of our users, like our employees, are very young. 80%, over 80% of our users are millennials. Among that, 22% of them are young families, and 60% are younger, are really young millennials from 25 to 34. So we are representing a really young uh, consumer base. Uh, we are one of the most well-funded uh, uh, startup right, uh, right, uh, so far. Um, we are celebrating our sixth anniversary. So we are still a very young com company, but we have been growing very, very aggressively. We have 27 uh, office, uh, offices uh, over the world. Uh, we are, our headquarters is in Hong Kong, as you know. Uh, we were founded in Hong Kong, and we have got uh, 520 million US dollars funding so far from leading investor, including Sequoia and SoftBank. In terms of consumer brand awareness, we are also one of the top OTAs already. Uh, I, when I show this chart to people, people are usually surprised by you know how fast we have grown because we are always in their mind, we are always a startup, we are always young, but it doesn't mean that we are small. If you look at all the key markets we operate in, in APAC, when you compare the traffic 
uh, brand awareness with other leading OTAs like Expedia, Skyscanner, TripAdvisor, these you know, um, big boys in, in the industry. You can see that we are already one of the top two or three players in most markets, including Hong Kong, Philippines, Singapore. You see the red line is our, is our brand awareness, Cook's awareness. Um, so, you know, you can see that in most market, we have already surpassed Expedia, TripAdvisor, and in some market, we have sur surpassed Skyscanners as well. Same for Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Okay, so the team I'm leading here at Clue is called Destination Marketing Team. So what we do is we offer Clue destination solutions for DMOs, destination marketing organizations like yourself, STO, KTO, JNTO, Hong Kong Tourism Board, Singapore Tourism Board. We help them in developing and marketing their organizations, uh, destinations. And here are a few partners that we have had so far. And it's a very young team. We have just built the team uh, for a year, over a year, but before that we have always been working with different DMOs already. In terms of our solutions, they are forming part of a solutions. Destination marketing is definitely one of the most important parts. And data in insights, product development, developing new tour packages, new itineraries with uh, DMOs, new events, and also industry enablement. Destination marketing, uh, no surprise, that's exactly uh, our unique strength. Uh, because we have a local marketing team, we have very strong local insights, and we do a lot of marketing ourselves. So it's our day job to do marketing. Data and insights, as you know, uh, we have a lot of data, consumer data, and our data is really relevant to destinations because we are not selling rooms, we are not selling flights. We know exactly what people are looking for in terms of what they want to do in a destinations, and that's to me, is the most important insights for destinations. And product development, definitely, we have been working with quite different DMOs to develop new products, especially in hidden gem location. For example, in Seoul, I'm sure there are a lot of neighborhoods to be discovered that is not well known yet. And how can we work together to develop new products, new itineraries, so that people, travelers, can explore uh, the deep the deeper side of soul and industry enablement and enablement. We have been doing quite a lot of education like this one, uh, but not for only for DMOs, but for the bigger industry, including hoteliers, uh, tour operators, attractions, even restaurants and shopping malls and event organizers, because they are all potentially our merchants and they can all benefit from uh, the knowledge, the insights, the experience we have especially when it comes to marketing. Um, one thing I want to highlight is, uh, first is other OTAs. I think we have the strongest local dedicated marketing teams in sub to support our work with destination partners. So in all the key markets we operate, we always have uh, a full marketing team, including usually ranging from 10 to 15 people. Uh, so we use a local model instead of some other OTAs, they use a regional model where a regional office actually oversees all marketing activities of different markets. So in each local team, we have a full marketing team with content, uh, creative and design, producing content, social and community social media, managing our own community, our fans, offline, online, performance marketing, data analytics, and also PR uh, team. It's pretty a full is it definitely a full-fledged, uh, complete marketing team in every market we operate in. So this is a summary of what we do on a daily basis, uh, uh, that what our marketing teams are doing on a daily basis. From inspiring travelers uh, with content marketing and influencers, you know, we are, we are a very young company. We know how to use KOL very well. And some of our staff are actually KOLs themselves. And also not so much, not only about the upper funnel, the content awareness, but also down to uh, bookings. At the end, what we want 
will be bookings for you and for us. So we are very strong in driving tactical campaigns, using discount at the right time and using performance marketing to drive conversions for destination partners and ourselves. One thing I want to highlight, as I've said already, the data that we have as an OTA is quite different from the data that, uh, data that other OTAs can offer. Um, because we, what we sell, the products where we sell are travel products and experiences. While other OTAs usually they focus on flight and accommodation. So the data collected are very different. The data we have is basically the itinerary of a traveler what they do in Seoul, what they see, and what they eat. But for other OTAs, what they can tell you is where do the travelers go in terms of country or city, at a city level, and how many days they are staying in, which hotel they are staying in, which airline they are, they are taking, which business class, is, are they staying in business class or economy, that's all. So the market insights that we can distill from our data is really about the traveler's preferences of a destination. What did they do in Seoul? Why did they like about Seoul? And even we can look into the reviews they give to the Seoul attractions, and we can tell you that you know, which attractions uh, are receiving really good score and which attractions are not so much um, uh, nice in terms of uh, customer scoring. These are the, uh, the, the, the things that you know, other OTAs find it hard to, to offer. So, so this is something I really want to highlight to you guys. In terms of our presence in Korea, um, uh, Korea is actually one of our top destinations. Um, we have 490 experiences all over South Korea. Um, of course, majority of it is actually in Seoul. And we've close to 2 million unit sales in 2019. And we have all the products across all verticals, attractions, tours, activities, transport, food, uh, and also hotel recommendation. One thing I want to highlight is we have just launched our hotel businesses in August last, uh, last month. And uh, in terms of the travelers coming to South Korea, the biggest market for us is Taiwan and Hong Kong, Philippines, and they're quite even, I would say, and then followed by Malaysia, Singapore, and other countries. So it's pretty well spread out in different uh, markets that we operate. Okay, this is so much about Kluk. Um, let's go into the key topic of today about the travel, new travel, new normal, as we call it after COVID-19. These are a few trends that we have spotted. Uh, over the past few months. The first thing is our view on the recovery. We think that the recovery is long and there are multiple stages within along the whole recovery journey. Although the recovery is long, we are expecting a full recovery. We are actually expecting the business to be fully back to 100% of 2019 level in 12 months after lockdown is lifted for a country. So it's a pretty long journey, but during the whole gradual recovery journey, every stage we have ident identified something for us to do together. So we start with 1.1, a uh, phase one where people are still under lockdown and they cannot really explore outside of their home. So we have experimented quite a lot of uh, home-based activities, home-based experiences bringing their experiences in home, to your home, so you don't have to go out. 1.2, uh, lockdown start to get lifted so people can start exploring their local city, their local neighborhood, but not so much local travel yet. And 1.3, people can actually explore their country. People can actually travel outside of their city. They can drive, they can take a train, to the cities uh, two, three hours away. So this is where domestic travel kicks in. Phase two, regional travel or bubbles. As you know, we are, there are a lot of discussion about travel bubbles. So this is when a regional travel resumes and phase three, of course, is global travels, basically back to pre-COVID level 
everyone can freely travel to uh, most places they want. In terms of the behavioral changes, we have spot five key changes due to COVID-19. Uh, I will walk through with you uh, one by one. Trend number one, rise of small groups, families, and FITs. So even before COVID-19, people have been embracing solo travel for some time. People actually see a big rising trends of more people, especially millennials, they want to travel alone. And our study in uh, 2019 actually showed that 76% of them are actually considering traveling alone by themselves. So this is really a rising trend, especially for destination like Seoul, it's so convenient. So it's one of the best destinations for solo traveler. But after COVID-19, we see an even bigger rise in this aspect. Other than solo travel, small scale family trips, you know, um, traveling with one or two friends, instead of joining group tours, uh, this is definitely the trend. Uh, so for one example is this Hong Kong private food tour. People start, we see that people start looking at more uh, private small group tour experiences so they don't, they don't have to mingle with people that they don't know uh, to, to have that social distancing uh, to a certain extent. So that's def definitely one thing for us to watch out for. Number two, trend number two, younger travelers are more likely to come back. So uh, especially uh, people aged between 18 to 35, the younger millennials, they're least vulnerable to COVID-19. And also they don't have kids, maybe they have less to worry about. So they are more courageous in terms of traveling again. So I think targeting them at the early stage of uh, recovery is really important for us. And especially for them, um, you know, most of them use social media. So I think uh, when we want to lure them back to our destinations, there are a few things we have to pay attention, especially on the social media. So this is something I want to highlight at the later part of this presentation, how we can leverage social media to do something. Trend number three, day trips and staycations are the first to, re to, re to bounce back. So this is more talking about when we are still within that 1.2, 1.3 stage where people cannot travel abroad, they cannot can only travel locally. So we are actually selling quite a lot of staycations and weekend getaways uh, in a lot of cities that we operate in, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, also Seoul to a certain extent. So if um, you guys are interested in working on staycation packages in Seoul, and we are very happy to explore how we can work together. Uh, we have got some quite some learning from Hong Kong. You know, selling a room alone usually doesn't work, but selling a room with some special features, maybe together with the activities that we are selling around the hotel or food experiences within a hotel, cooking class, you know, cocktail classes, or as simple as, uh, as uh, attraction tickets. This kind of bundle actually quite works quite well in other countries. Try number four. Uh, increased preferences for outdoor-based activities. Um, so people want, don't want to stay indoor and also they want to get healthier. They pay more attention to health. So because of these two reasons, they are looking at more outdoor scenic activities. I think for Seoul, this may not be the first thing that people think about. When people think of Seoul, maybe the first thing they com that comes to mind may not be outdoor i'm sure there's a lot outdoor activities that we can do we can sell for Seoul uh, for our travelers so again it leads to the new product development thing that we're happy to work with Seoul on trend number five uh definitely focus on hygiene and public safety um we see that you know uh the protocols 
in terms of ensuring restaurants and attractions, transportation are clean, uh, health uh, safe uh, is very important. So one example that we work with and uh, with the transportation merchants in South Korea is to pro provide a, a safe private uh, airport pickup service at Incheon. So um, we include disposable seat cover barriers be between driver and the passengers. And of course, drivers have to put on mask all time to prevent the transmission. So make it safe. Uh, so that travelers can come back to Seoul much earlier. Okay, so, but having said that, I think uh, it's still a time be before the international travelers start coming back. So um, before we actually uh, have the recovery, we have actually pivoted in our business to focus uh, our resources on domestic market. At the beginning, we start with home-based experiences. So we run exa examples here. Uh, we bring in some online classes, wine tasting classes, DIY classes to your home, and also you know, some kind of workshops. We actually develop the materials to your home and you just follow the video and you can actually make your own leather card holder, stuff like that. Um, so that you can kill time at home. And also we have started launched, we have also launched our in-home food delivery services. Uh, as you know, restaurants are closed, people cannot go out and, and, and dine. So in-home delivery was a big hit in a few markets. And then for other markets, including South Korea, we have shifted our focus to domestic tourism. So helping, travel, helping, helping our consumers explore their own cities, explore their home countries, is something that we have been doing quite a lot. And uh, as consumers' behaviors change, we also, we, we not only have to offer different things to the consumers, but we also have to engage with them in new ways. And especially for millennials, definitely social media is getting more and more important. And one interesting thing that we have spotted over the years is that social media is now not only enabling engagement, interaction with their friends and brands, but social media is actually enabling instant purchase right inside social media. So we see this trend as from e-commerce to S-commerce. S-commerce meaning social commerce. And how big is social commerce really? By 2021, the global social commerce market will increase by about 34%. And by 2023, sales value will exceed 735 billion US dollars. So it's a huge market, it's rapidly growing. So I really urge you guys to, I'm, I'm sure you guys have been paying attention to this. And I'm, I think it's really important to, to not miss this golden opportunity. And, and something that we, we, are, we, we have asked ourselves is what made social commerce so successful? I think social commerce deliver quite a few things. It, deliver, it delivers more values than traditional e-commerce and it's because it's a natural extension of the existing consumer's behavior. Because every day you are hopping on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube to view contents. On average, you know, every day, everyone spends two and a half hours on social media. And 80% of them have, buy, have bought something online, on social media. And social commerce has been prominent and it's going to expand into different channels. One thing that I want to highlight today is live streaming. As you know that in the past one or two years, live streaming on social media has basically taken the center stage of engagement. 
YouTube, YouTube live stream, uh, uh, TikTok, Facebook stream, um, uh, uh, Instagram, they are all hopping on this live streaming uh, bandwagon. And what is so special about live streaming? It's definitely the rising media for video content. Uh, as you know, video content has been more and more important over images. And basically live streaming, you can in, in, interpret live streaming as another form of video content consumption, something similar to the TV station. Um, popular across all social medias, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and even some e-commerce platform like Alibaba in China have embraced this technology. Unlike videos, it allows real-time interaction. Real-time real -time interaction is really important, especially important for commerce, for driving sales. There are three special things about live streaming that I think we should pay attention to. Number one is a huge growth potential. Number two is a huge audience base. And number three is more higher consumer engagement. In terms of growth potentials for live stream, um, the markets, the live streaming market is growing at a very high rate, basically around 18% every year, year on year. As you can see that uh, by 2027, it will be 184 billion US dollar markets. And even without such a high growth rate, right now, social media is already one of the best uh, place, one of the biggest uh, pool of audience that you can reach. So there is a huge audience base already. Over the world, we have almost 4 billion people using social media, almost on a daily basis. And it equals to 51% of the entire population. So it's very very huge if you look at all these players facebook 2.6 youtube uh, 2, 2 billion so it's a huge audience base already and what, but the most important thing is is offering a much better experience for consumer engagement 80 percent of consumers says that uh, they would rather watch a live video than reading a blog and 82% would prefer live video from a, from a brand to a social media post. And 64% of customers are more likely to buy a product online after watching a video. So this is the power of live streaming and live video. And we also see other factors that is even uh, accelerating the potential further. Uh, one thing is definitely um, the mobile uh, accounts for most visits across web and social medias. So um, more and more traffic is shifting from uh, desktop to mobile. And most of the consumption on live streaming is on mobile. The second thing is 5G. 5G in a lot of countries will actually enable a much faster and much more uh, higher, higher, higher de uh, uh, definition video, more functionality within the live streaming function. So it will enable much better experience for live streaming moving forward. And consumers are proven to be uh, comfortable with new formats of transaction. More and more people are actually shifting their purchase from online, to offline to online, from online to social media, and from social media to live stream. And one last trend is because of COVID-19. Because of COVID-19, a lot of people are getting used to, have got used to this live streaming. Um, kids are using Zoom for class. Parents have been buying a lot of iPads these past few months. Uh, people uh, working from home are, are getting used to online conferences. So all these tre trends has helped change the consumer's behavior so that they are more readily uh, uh, to, they are more ready to adopt the new, the new live streaming technology. In terms of who is watching the live streaming right now, we see that I think without a doubt, 
most of them are millennials. They are young people. So 18 from uh, age 18 to 34, this is the main group of consumers watching live stream content and also created live stream content as well. And one thing that is very relevant to you guys is this trend that we see is not evenly distributed globally. We see that APEC is actually leading this transition from e-commerce to social commerce, from social commerce to live streaming. So we are actually in the fastest growing region in the world in terms of social media usage and adoption. Okay, so how, how do we, or how do our merchants leverage this trend? There are a few things that we see that people are doing already right now. Um, number one is entertainment. One example is Alibaba has actually experimented using entertainment, combine the entertainment element with their retail. For example, the picture you see here on the left-hand side is a live streaming fashion show that they ran in China. And at the same time, they're selling all these clothes right away, instantly, immediately. So that's entertainment plus retail, retailtainment, some people call it. The second thing uh, that is actually not new to us, I think in a lot of countries, we always have these TV channels specialized in selling stuff. Uh, you will have two TV hosts basically doing a lot of education, educating products. Does this, this is especially relevant if, for example, a destination like, like Seoul want to educate consumers about the new products, new neighborhoods, and new itineraries that we want them to start looking into. So consumer education is another thing that we see people are doing, brands are doing. And last but not least is sales activation. A lot of um, instant offers, special price, limited quantity discount, uh, are proven to be very successful in live streaming. Uh, as you may have heard, this kink of lipstick in China. He can actually, he's actually a man, but he's very good in selling cosmetics products in China. So he could actually make a 300,000 US dollar sale in one hour over live streaming with limited offers. So these are the three things that we, we have seen so far. But onto the travel and tourism industry, uh, we have actually taken a step further to use live streaming to bring the destination to you at home. So these are a few things we have done with our merchants in Indonesia, US, Spain, and UK. We actually work with our merchants and attractions to do a live stream, for example, to the Bali Safari and to the towel tours in US, um, basically bring the destination to your home. Okay, so this, this is when I want to introduce our new function. Um, the background is right now, most of the people, they use live stream, they do live stream. Most, most of the brands, they do live stream on, on uh, social media channels, like Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. But we see a limitation to that because we, you cannot um, control the functions on Facebook. And we, if you want to buy something when you're watching a Facebook Live, you cannot do it within Facebook. You still have to leave your comment uh, at the post and you have to click on the link. You have to go onto the merchant's website to buy that product. So that's why we have developed our own Klug Live. So basically we are doing live streaming on our own Klug app. Okay, so right now we have just launched this function in mid-August, so it's a very exciting time. Right now we are offering four key pillars within Cook Life. Number one is product education, uh, especially for new attractions, new destinations. We see the need of educating consumers why they should go there. 
So number one, product education. Number two is entertainment and gamification. So an uh, example here is that uh, we invited a top cooking KOL in Hong Kong. He's a very famous uh, uh, cooking YouTuber. And we worked with him on an entertainment show. It's like a cooking show, live, but, but on live stream. And he is teaching our, our users how to use this new uh, Bruno uh, cooking device at home to make seafood dishes. So it's like a live entertainment. But if people are, are interested, they can actually buy that uh, cooking device and also the in-home del food delivery right away inside the app. The third thing is real-time interaction. Uh, one example here is we engage two KOLs and they can actually instantly engage with the fans within our two. These two are actually real people, real consumers joining in the live streaming. And this is uh, in Philippines. And of course, we have tactical discount. This is an example where we work with Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore uh, to offer a free upgrade to the staycation. But um, so basically, uh, uh, if you look at Klug Live, we can use that in all three, uh, all, all key stages within the consumer journey from top funnel inspiration all the way to purchase and advocacy. So stage one is about inspiring and educating the consumers about your destinations. Stage two is further engage with the users and convince the users to buy with tactical discounts. And also we can increase the brand stickiness with Soul and Kluke through content and entertainment, instant interaction with KOLs in Seoul, for example. And stage three, what we see is that a lot of uh, people who have joined the live streaming will actually share the live streaming on their WhatsApp, Kakao, or Facebook account. So it can also help us do the last step, which is the efficacy. Some, of, some more functional features of our Kluke Live to, to make sure uh, you understand how we are doing it. So the number one thing is, you know, when you guys are, when you are watch, watching any of our live streaming, you can give a thumbs up, give in heart, give some emojis to, so that you can, you can get engaged in that. Uh, our host will ask you questions. Sometimes we'll ask you, ask you questions. Do you like this product uh, from Seoul, for example? And if you like it, you can, you can uh, give in heart so that people know that. Other people looking at the live stream also know that, oh, a lot of people are giving feedback. Let's, let's do it. So this is interaction element of the live, stream, live streaming. The second part, which is super important, is when you're watching the live stream, at the left corner, uh, lower corner, you can see a back here. And some if you click on the back, you can go to the product page. And sometimes, when the, uh, at a certain point of time in the live streaming, the host will announce, okay, there is a limited limited discount right now, 20% off on the tours right now. So the discount will appear right here. If you click on it, you will go to the product page and you will see all the discounted prices. And what's more important is you can book it right now, right away, without leaving without leaving the live streaming. So you are still watching the live streaming while you are buying things. It's like a split green screen on your mobile phone. So this is really important. And the, the last thing feature is uh, we allow the live streaming on multiple channels, not only on our uh, 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 app, but also we will repost the live streaming on Facebook and other social media channels. And we see that actually after the live streaming, a lot of people will watch it again, watch it again after the live streaming in within our uh, Clook app or on the social media channels, especially when there is a special offer within the live streaming. So people don't want to miss out. So these are the key features right now. We are still at a very early stage. We are going to add in a lot of other features down the road. 
And people can share that on their social media uh, very instantly. And also uh, we have a performance dashboard at the back end so we can monitor the metrics in real time and optimize on an ongoing basis. Okay, these are a few countries that we have uh, run our live streaming, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, and more to come, more to come. So uh, definitely hope that you will join in our next one in Korea if we are running that again. And we run it across different uh, products, verticals as well. Experiences, shopping even. So we have run something of uh, a live streaming of selling a basket of products from overseas, uh, some souvenirs from Singapore, from some food from Thailand, coffee bean from Indonesia, and delivered to your home. And also dining experiences, in-home delivery, and staycation. These are all the more relevant experience now because people cannot travel abroad. So these are all the domestic tourism experiences that we can offer. Uh, that's the end of my sharing. Uh, thank you for your time and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a really special, special crisis. As, as we look back in the history, uh, Clue is very young, so we didn't, we haven't faced a lot of uh, crisis ourselves. But if we look at the industry starting from 911, SARS, Mars, financial crisis before, it's, it, it used to be very regional or local. So this is the first time that there's a global pandemic and it's a very long event so we have been into it for almost nine months and we don't see an end to it uh, and uh, it actually breaks the globalization apart if you look at the whole thing together with uh, geopolitical situation in america china everywhere in the world so i think i uh, we uh, the big picture is very clear we see that we are in a very bilateral or regional uh, time now, right now at the moment. And as recovery happens, I also we also foresee that it will be a lot of bilateral. So country and country kind of travel, travel bubbles. It won't be a global market anymore uh, in the short uh, 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 future. Uh, when it comes to marketing, it's very different. Uh, to a little bit to share with you, at Clue we used to be uh, we have local marketing teams in different cut market, so that is very different from other OTAs. We have very strong local marketing team in all the markets we operate. We have an office in Seoul, Taiwan, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, everywhere we operate. We have a local marketing team, so. I think that's uh, very important because as we move forward for any destination in the world, I think we cannot operate using a global mindset. So Seoul in China and Seoul in Hong Kong, Seoul in Singaporeans can be very different marketing games. So I think this is one big change that we are seeing uh, moving forward. A, a little bit uh, sharing on what we are focusing on right now. Uh, no, no one travels, but uh, the good thing about us is that we can sell domestic products to domestic people. So we are focusing on uh, helping Seoul, pe Seoul people exploring Seoul or Koreans exploring Koreans. So we have that across all markets. Uh, in all markets, we see that a lot of new activities are getting more and more popular. So one example, not in Korea, but in uh, other places is glamping. So glamping is glamorous camping. Glamping I, I think you're, you're, uh, is very great. I think Korea has a lot to offer on this area. Uh, I think people really want to stay outdoor and want to get to the nature and they are very stressed at this time. So I think glamping, have family time, 
is, is very good for the family people. Um, staycation and staycation is very big now. But when it comes to staycation, we see that people prefer rural areas kind of staycation. And then they just they don't just want to stay in the room. They want a room plus dining plus some outdoor activities around the hotels. So staycation is another big thing uh, that we see a lot of people are looking for. And of course, uh, other outdoor activities for young people like in Korea or in, in, in Korea in general, maybe, uh, for example, go-karting, driving go-kart, canoeing, zip lining, uh, renting a yard. All these are pretty popular in the past few months. I think um, when you look at the the trends that I share in the in the presentation in Thailand, we see other OTAs that are very strong. Agoda has been in the market for many years, so Agoda's headquarters is in Bangkok, and so they are very strong as an OTA. And in Indonesia, you know, Traveloka is a big local company with a local with a lot of support from the government. So these are strong local brands in the market. So right now we are not the number one OTA in those markets. But if you look at our competitors, they are not really our competitors, really, because we have very different business model. A goal that focus a lot on accommodations, hotel rooms, and, and, and travel local focus on flights, domestic travel within Indonesia and then accommodations. We are the only ones specialized in activities and experiences. So we are not really straight competitors. If you look at our competition, there are not many competition in Asia. The only one, the only one that is really our closest com competitors, um, maybe in uh, KK Day in Taiwan, in Taiwan only, because they are, their business model is totally focusing on Taiwan. Or maybe in Korea, my real trip is similar, a little bit similar to our business model. But I think one, one thing to highlight about why Clue is so big in Philippines, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, is the network effect. So on the supply side, we are the only company in Asia who has top attractions in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, everywhere in Asia. So a traveler, after they, they have done a trip, let's say to Hong Kong, they have used Clue for the first time. The next time when they open the app and they come to Seoul, they will think, they will think of Clue as the first brand they want to go to. And, and on Clue, they can find the most number of attractions they know in Seoul. So I think this network effect is really important because the users do not want to use many apps and different trips. They want to use one, two or three apps in all the trips. So I think this network effect is really what makes us successful in most markets. But definitely we are having a very strong plan in Thailand in and as well as Indonesia, uh, marketing, a lot of marketing plan there as well. But because of COVID, everything has slowed down. You are very, you are, you are very right. Actually, we surpassed KK Day last year, became the number one OTA, experiences OTA in Taiwan already. So starting last year, we are now number one. But I think even before that, uh, we are already num we were already number one when it comes to outbound Taiwan. So when Taiwan people travels outside of Taiwan, uh, they would use Clue more more than KK Day. But when they travel within the country within Taiwan, they would use KK Day a bit more. So that's the long history because again is the network effect. KK Day do not have uh, so many products as we do when it comes to other cities. Uh, Seoul, uh, Korea, Japan, other, other markets, other countries, destinations. So I think this, uh, this, again, it goes back to our very strong supply as our number one marketing strategy. If you have the right products, the good products, you know, 
consumers will stay with the brand. I think another part, big part of our marketing strategy is actually content marketing. So we are very strong in content marketing, especially travel content marketing. You may you may think that ah, Kluk and KK Day, you are very good at you know giving discounts, special price, and all that. We do have that, but I think the bigger investment actually goes to content marketing. So our strategy is. Starting from the beginning of a trip, when people have an idea to travel, what they need is look for ideas, inspiration. Okay, I want to go. I want to come to Seoul, but uh, any new things to do in Seoul today? So, if you think of all the OTAs, they they would not go to Skyscanner, they would not go to Expedia, they would go to experience OTAs like Kluk. Uh, to look for new activities and experiences, so we spend a lot of money at the top of the funnel to push out contents about different destination, different new things to do with KOLs that target the young people. So I think uh, the number two strategy is content marketing, and of course it leads to number three. We know the young millennial consumers. Very well. A lot of our colleagues are very young. I'm I'm kind of old in the company, so they know the consumers very well. So I think that these are the key factors to our success in markets, including Taiwan. We have a lot, a lot of uh, different projects with most of the destinations in the region. Um, from in, I think in Korea, uh, we are also top. We have been working with Gyeonggi in Korea, Jeju. Uh, we are we know we know Kangwon and Incheon, and we have some conversation there, and as well as KTO as well. Uh, in Japan, JNTO, uh, we have some we have worked with them before, and also we have worked with Hokkaido, Okinawa, uh, Tohoku. Uh, different destinations. So, so I would say a lot, a lot of different uh, DMOs. In, even to Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, um, we have been working with them pretty closely. But um, I will highlight one or two bigger showcase. So, Dubai. A few years, two years back, we have worked with Dubai uh, on a big KOL campaign. So, uh, we invited KOLs because we. We have a network of KOLs in different markets. Our local team, marketing team, they know the local KOLs very well. They work together on a daily basis. So Dubai Tourism actually want us to help them invite different KOLs from eight markets in Asia to travel to Dubai to create a lot of content. So that's a huge campaign. I think uh, after today, uh, JJ and I can go back and organize some materials and share with you. So you have the PowerPoint. You can look at the videos and all that. So that's Dubai. And another thing that I, I am very excited about and I want to share with you is, as I said, because of COVID, we have changed our focus to travel to domestic almost 100%. In a few months, so um, but it's very exciting. We have just signed a, an agreement with Singapore Tourism Board uh, to help them, together with Expedia, to help the Singapore government promote domestic consumption in Singapore, and it's going to begin in October, uh, very soon. So um, these may be the bigger, bigger ones. And another interesting area I would highlight is on event. So if you look at our Kluk app, if you don't have our app, I, I urge you to download our app right <laughs> away. Uh, please do, because we have new things coming up every, every day. And one thing that is very uh, successful is events. So I know events to every destination is very important. So to Seoul is one of the key capitals for events in a region. And we have been selling a lot of event tickets on our platform from concerts to shows to different, mar even marathon. So marathon, you can buy a marathon ticket if you want to run a marathon in Hong Kong or in Japan or in Korea, Taiwan, in different 
faces. So I think uh, we we have been working with Hong Kong Tourism Board on this wine and dine festival. So in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Tourism Board, I used to work in Hong Kong Tourism Board, actually. And, and wine and dine festival is their biggest event every year. And we have been their uh, official ticketing platform uh, since last year. But this year, they have no physical wine and dine. It becomes virtual wine and dine. So we have been, we are going to work with them to bring this whole physical event to a virtual event. So consumers can, can watch uh, some entertainment, cooking shows online, and they can order special wine, special menu delivered to their home. So, so this is another interesting that, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting with the destinations. Uh, I have a long answer to that. Uh, so <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think it would be great for JJ to schedule another call with, with, with you guys or with different markets uh, to go through how we usually work with DMOs because there are a lot of things that we have been working with DMOs. But uh, let me quickly cover a few areas. Definitely number one is destination marketing. So promoting Seoul uh, and the experiences in Seoul uh, in different markets. So that's the number one thing we are very good at. We are, we are very familiar with. And uh, the big part of it is, again, content marketing. Especially now people cannot travel, but we want to keep the awareness of Seoul in their mind. So when they travel again, they will think of Seoul first, right? So I think creating content, building up our content bank, and then for the new consumers, for the new normal, is number one thing I would suggest to focus on right now. And then uh, number two is also a look at our products. Uh, other than just promoting a destination, we are also very good at developing a destination and which includes develop new products, new experiences, new itineraries, new tours. Um, because we have a full team in Korea, in Seoul, we have an office in Seoul and we have uh, different teams dedicated to different parts of Korea. They go to Korea, they go to Gangwon, go to Gyeonggi, go to Jeju to talk to the local tour operators, attractions there. To, to create a new product. So I believe so. Uh, you guys, STO has a lot of plans about new destination, uh, new tours, new products in Seoul. I think that's something we can work together to create new products. Uh, and then number three will be uh, education of the industry. Because in our industry, unlike the hotel industry, the hoteliers or airlines people they know technology, they know digital uh, a lot better than tour operators, attractions, restaurants owners, you know, uh, taxi drivers. So, so I think this industry um, really needs a lot of education about what we are talking about today. Digital, technology, millennial travelers, and how can we bring business to them? But they need to learn all these things. They have to embrace it instead of saying no, 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 no. So I think another job that I've done with Destination is to work together with Destination uh, Tourism Boards to educate the industries. So that's number three. And number four, the last one is data and insights. So on our platform, you know, we have a lot of, not now because people are not traveling, but in the past, we used to have a lot of data about, you know, a Chinese consumers, Hong Kong consumers, come to Seoul, what did they do? What did they buy? Uh, what's the review score for different things? So we know a lot of uh, uh, insights into what people like about our destination. And we can even compare Seoul with other similar cities like Hong Kong, Taipei, Singapore, or Tokyo, Osaka, to see you know, what's the difference between travelers going to different destinations. Um, so I, I would say four major areas, marketing, business, uh, new product development, industry education, and data. 
but JJ will have a lot more detail to share. Uh, spot on. I think uh, Muslim tra travelers is a very important new travelers for the for the world and the region. As you look at uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, the two of the major Muslim markets, uh, honestly, no one has been very successful in in tapping into these travelers yet for now. Uh, I would say, except for a very some, some very small players in Malaysia, they specialize in serving Muslim travelers. Um, but in terms of regional or global OTAs, no one has been very successful. But early last year, in early 2019, we established a task force, internal task force, focused on Muslim travelers. And I think the major barrier is not so much on marketing, because the Muslim young people, especially the young Muslim, they are very similar. Uh, in terms of they love KOLs, they, they love music, they love this and that. So they use social media every day. In terms of marketing, we don't see a big difference. But in terms of the, the, the travel behavior is very different. Um, normally, they, they need different food. They need halal food. And there are a lot of different halals. Uh, if you look into the details, and they need to pray five times a day, you know, and they need to be very clean before they pray. So, so the destination has a lot to do, a lot to do to, to, to cater to their need. Everyone is talking about halal tourism, Muslim tourism, um, but uh, so far, I think um, there is very limited cases that we can refer to outside of most, uh, Malaysia or Indonesia. So our focus was to test our Muslim um, campaign, so to speak, for Malaysians and Indonesians. And we had some early success uh, before, but you know that was right before COVID-19. So soon uh, after we started the task force, basically everything, everything stopped. But if, because we, I see there is a big role for tourism boards to play. If that's your priority, we would love to talk to you and see how you can support the travelers. And we can support you to um, use technology, to use te technology to make it easy for the Muslim travelers to find what they need in Seoul, for area to, play, to pray, Friend, halal friendly restaurants, things like that. Um, I think te technology can play a big role. So if you are, if you guys are interested, I would definitely um, uh, connect you, you guys, with our Muslim task force. Maybe later uh, after you know uh, recovery happens. I, I was. I would think China is quite different, uh, especially when you think about Asian travelers, especially the younger Asian travelers, the mainstream uh, China um, Asian travelers. Uh, China, I don't think is a top destination for them yet. Maybe some of them want to go to the Great Wall to have a look, but they're still a minority. It's not just. It's not that cool to go to China, to be honest, except Hong Kong uh, as a city. Um, but I think Japan and Korea do have, uh, do see, I do see that neck to neck competition. So Japan used to be a, a, top, a top destination in the region without a doubt. And Korea in the past 10 years has been climbing up very quickly, very aggressively. If you ask me, I was from a more uh, older generation that you know we see a lot of Japanese drama in the region but in the past 10 years no people watch Japanese drama all of them watch K K drama K-pop Running Man uh, all this show so if, uh, I've been to Southeast Asia many times the young people they really love Korean culture so I think it's very different because of the culture and they really like 
K-pop, K K drama, Korean culture. So I think that's a big advantage you guys have, especially Seoul is you know there are many K dramas shot in Seoul or around Seoul. So I think you should really leverage that uh, and also concerts. Uh, things in 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 that area. So, versus Japan, I think you do have that pop culture uh, working for you guys. But still, I think Japan is still a very strong brand. Uh, you know, with with a lot of uh, beautiful sceneries, great great food, and all that. So, I I would suggest that you guys should maybe work on food. Food is something that I think is kind of underrepresented. In Korea, so people there are a lot of Korean restaurants everywhere now and in, in, in the region, but they're not. I don't see a lot of content about Korean food. I see. I've I've read a lot of stories content about Japanese food. You know, the Japanese chef. They they have spent forty years perfecting the knife and all that. A lot of story behind that. So as a traveler, I want to go there. I want to taste the wagyu. You know, a lot of stories about wagyu. But how about Korean beef? How about you know traditional Korean food? People love Korean food, but they they do not know the stories behind the Korean food. So I think that's one area. Food is number one, one of the biggest thing, especially for Asian travelers. So I think that's one area that uh, maybe you, uh, I see a lot of potential in that. And the other area I would suggest to look at is transportation, because in Japan it's very easy to drive. Self drive is such a big thing in Japan. Uh, when people from Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, they go to Japan, they drive. But when I come to Korea, I want to drive. It's quite difficult for me to drive because I cannot read the character. Google Map does not work in, in in Korea. So, but I think it's improving. Our company is also looking at, at the car rental service in Korea. I think it's a big, big opportunity because you guys have a huge country. But of course, within Seoul, I think car rental is not a big thing. But if you can offer, I I I don't think people come to Seoul only for Seoul. I think most people come to Seoul for the region. They didn't know that they have been to Kangwon or Gyeonggi. No one understands Kangwon and Gyeonggi. They think that it's around bigger Seoul. So I think if you can improve that, um, a lot more people will think about Seoul and uh, uh, the bigger Seoul area and self-drive uh, tours and all that. So yeah, at the top of my mind, and these are the two big things I, I would focus on. 